I guess I'd like to address some of these issues. These are the six questions that we ask ourselves for many, many years, over and over again, and hoping that we will come to some understanding. So why is it that some younger people have fractures more often than others? Why is it that older people have more fractures than younger people? Why is it that some women have more fractures than others, some men more than others, some women more than men, and some races more than other races? I can't possibly address all of these issues, but some of the principles can easily be applied across sex and across race, which makes these comparative studies so, in, so really interesting and so informative. Bone strength at the end of life is determined by the material composition of the bone and how that material is woven during growth into a three-dimensional biomechanical masterpiece of engineering. Most of the strength of bone, or the peak strength of bone, is of course developed during intrauterine life and during subsequent growth to the completion of growth as defined by closure of the epiphyses. Subsequent to that, certain changes take place in the cellular machinery of bone remodeling that compromise the material composition of bone and its structure that results in increased bone fragility. But the origins of bone fragility or the antecedents of bone fragility have their origin during growth and development. The message of the next few slides is this, that youth certainly, as Oscar Wilde said, is wasted on the young, but it is also wasted on the paediatrician. All the paediatrician thinks about is final height. Now, as I'll try to demonstrate to you, it really, life is much more interesting than final height. It doesn't matter so much. Each of us are two people, and the study of the two of us, sometimes by using twins, is extremely informative. Bone is rope. Rope is the type 1 collagen or the triple helix when wound about itself is very strong in tension but in compression it's hopeless. And so nature has impregnated this rope with crystals of calcium hydroxyapatite. And when it does this with increasing amounts, it reaches a compromise. My late father told me life, the success of life, is finding that compromise. So if there is too much mineral in that bone, the material becomes too stiff, too brittle. If there's not enough bone, not enough mineral within that rope, it becomes too flexible. But what is it that we mean by too stiff or too flexible? And that is where the spe specific mineral content is chosen for a specific function in a specific organ. And so during growth and development, you see the tissue mineral density increase to its maximum during growth, which is 67% ash. In other words, if you take a fibril, it is fully occupied to 67% of its fixed volume by crystals of calcium hydroxyapatite. The rest is made up of collagen fibril and water. And the process of secondary mineralization is the expulsion of water without changing the volume of that fibril. And that becomes important when we think about therapeutics. In the antler of the deer, the amount of mineral within that antler is low. 
because the function of that antler is to deform during the mating season so the guy with the most flexible antlers, his antlers spring back and they remain intact. Whereas the guy who has too, the antlers too stiff, they snap, the girl looks at him, says, no way, I'm going to marry you, forget about it, you're a loser, that species dies out. If you are unfortunate enough to be born as the Malleus Incus and Stapes, you are 90% mineral. And the function of that is, of course, as a tuning fork. It must not dissipate any, the vibration must not be dissipated in bending. All of the energy must be dissipated in vibrating and sending messages to the brain. And here is the human bone sitting somewhere in the middle. So this material is designed to be just right, like the three little bears. Not too much, not too little, just right. Not too hot, not too cold. And that principle works right through the whole of the hierarchic structure of bone. That material is then taken with the nature's thread and it is woven using something very smart, nothing. So nature uses nothing to fashion a three-dimensional structure in space. One is a tubular bone pushing the mineralized cortex further from the neutral axis, enabling it to resist bending. And the beauty of that is that the expansion in the marrow cavity here the greater that is relative to the movement of the periosteum, it produces a thinner cortex because it can. This is the Clinton principle, very important, that you can use less material by distributing that material in a more appropriate biomechanical place. So larger people pin more, they are more hollow, their volumetric density, the apparent volumetric density, is lower because they can. They, the same amount of material through its three-dimensional position in space gives it the strength it needs to minimize its mass. And so this, this structure is strong in this position, in this direction, in its peak loading, but it's weak in its deformability. This structure here is strong in the X direction. Now the same glug of mineralized material is used to fashion using nothing this sponge-like material that has a, the ability to deform to some small, still small, small degrees. I say small because stiffness of bone is its critical property in a gravitational field, of course. So these structures are formed together, formed in this way. But here's, this is some work from one of my students, and I'll just show some pictures of, of some of them. This is Roger Zabezi. These students you know, have honored me by being with me, and now I'm honored by being their students. And I'm learning a lot from them, and particularly from Roger Zabezi. One of the studies that we did together was to take sections of the proximal femur, and what's interesting here is the amount of area, despite this very different shape and size, it's the same amount of stuff being used to build a very different structure. But what is going on here is that most of the stuff, most of the mineralized bone is used to make a cortex and that cortex is much thicker at the bottom here and very thin, this is the Achilles heel of the femoral neck, very thin in this particular region. And this is the distribution of cortical thickness. To think about bone as having a cortical thickness is naive. There is no such thing as a cortical thickness. There are cortical thicknesses, and they serve specific purposes around a cross section and every section along a bone. So we can't just close our eyes, use a bone density machine, and think that we're going to spit out something that is going to express this biology, this diversity, which is the essence of, of course, of survival. So here, there's progressively less cortical bone, and the distribution here, nearer the head, is more similar for the cortical thickness, 
but most of the bone now is trabecular for certain reasons. The same thing occurs when we look along the shaft of a long bone, that at every single cut, it's a completely different organ, which means that the modelling and remodelling at any single point on the periosteum and on the endocortical surface here is different. They are different in absolute terms, and they are different in relative terms. Otherwise, we couldn't produce a bone of different thicknesses. And this is some, an, another one of my students who's taught me a lot, and I'll show you what that is shortly, and I, I think you'll learn from this as well. This is the change during growth and development of the shape of the bone. Birds fly because their wings were imprinted in their genetic material. The shape of that bone is already present in the blueprint of the material. And during growth and development, there is differing degrees, 38 milligrams here, 14 milligrams here, 10 milligrams here, and so forth, built up together to increase the strength of the bone in given directions. Long bones... They don't grow like chewing gum. Different bones grow at different rates at the given, at different epiphyses. In the leg, in the, the tibia, the rapidity of growth in length is occurring predominantly due to growth at the proximal epiphysis. In the forearm, the, the rapidity, most of the length of the radius is produced by growth at the distal metaphysis. And this is very important. This is Ali Gazem, who runs our QCT department and who's done some of the contributed to this work. What is happening here is as the long bone is growing very rapidly at the radius, the, the trabeculae that are like a forest are condensing together, corticalizing. The cortex at the distal radius is trabecular in origin. The cortex in the mid-shaft is from periosteal apposition. Those who argue that cortical and trabecular bone are different have to be able to address that question about the distal radius, which is a common fracture site. Now, this is data from Cadet, published in the Journal of Surgery. It is a fantastic paper. You if you're interested in this area, please read it. Here is showing the bone formation taking place on the trabeculae. And as the bone formation takes place, the trabeculae fuse together. If because of the rapidity of rapid longitudinal growth, the fusion of the trabeculae is delayed, leaving a residual temporary porosity during the pubertal acceleration. And that porosity predisposes to forearm fractures should, in childhood should a fall occur. And this is more so in the male than it is in the female. And this is the decrease here in the total cross-sectional area um, that is occurring in the male. And the porosity goes temporarily up and if the kid swings from some tree, falls over, fracture results. We've now looked at the morphological basis of fractures. This is a, a, some preliminary data from um, Johan Bella, who's uh, working with me now from Lyon, France, a past student of Boivin and Pierre Del, the late Pierre Delmas. And this is a collaboration with uh, Sandeep Kozler. When we've looked at the morphological basis of forearm fractures in the case control study, and what the point is here, in people who have low bone density, that the major discriminant for fractures is the presence of porosity. So irrespective of whether bone density is low or high, the porosity is increased, and it is the better discriminant of uh, fracture in this case control study than is bone density. And when bone density is low and porosity is low, this is very protective of um, forearm fractures. As the long bone grows in length, there's racial differences and sex differences in the timing of puberty and in the pattern of ap apposition of bone upon bone surfaces. If you take anything from this lecture, I want you to take one thing. 
I want you to stop thinking about bone and start thinking and asking questions about its envelopes. If you turn the question about exercise, genetics, this, whatever you want, into what is happening with exercise on the periosteum, on the endocortical surface, on either side of the trabeculae, and on the surfaces that traverse the cortex, the intracortical envelope, you will start asking the right and answerable question, which is one of the huge challenges, I think, in research. And you can't do it with bone densitometry. If you want to keep doing it, you're staying in the 20th century. If you want to stay in the 20th century, that's up to you. During puberty, there is rap continued growth in the male with periosteal apposition. It's not faster than in girls. It goes on longer. We are bigger than, males are bigger than females because our puberty starts later and continues on longer. So we deposit bone on the external surface. At the time of puberty, growth stops in the female. Endocortical bone formation occurs here, producing a cortex that is approximately similar by, similar by race and by sex. But the position of that cortex in space is further out in the male. What happens if you have delayed puberty is very different morphologically and also very different in terms of the biomechanical consequences. So for example, with delayed puberty here, there is continued growth. Without this shot of periosteal apposition, the bone continues to grow, but it's a smaller bone with a thinner cortex. In girls, because of lack of estrogen and the continued patency, patency of the epiphyses, the bone gets bigger, but it doesn't get its hit of endocortical bone formation. So it's a bigger bone, but it has a thin cortex. Therefore, the consequences I would predict of delayed puberty will be worse in the male than in the female because the woman's got a thin cortex too, which is still similar to the male, but it's placed further out, giving that biomechanical advantage of position. Here's height. This is height velocity. It's very rapid at birth. It goes down, accelerates up, remains constant, then accelerates at puberty to then close the epiphyses and come down. But when you break this down, this is the two people story that I'm getting at. You break this down, this acceleration at this time, I think with the appearance of, of growth hormone receptors, is in the legs. And then the legs cruise along more rapidly than puberty, at, till puberty, and then the epiphyses close without an acceleration and decelerate to produce the final leg length. This is the spine, very different, different regulation. Here the spine remains low, then nothing much happens, then the speed's up to equal the speed in the legs, and then both of them drift down together. What does that mean? It means a lot, because you've got all your kids in school of the same age, but they're not at the same maturational level. So when a disease strikes, and this is a unique feature of diseases in growth, when a disease strikes, it is not just the dose of the disease and the duration of the disease, it, it, the morphological effects depend on the maturational stage of the individual when struck by that illness. And so you can imagine, for example, when an illness is struck here, both limbs will be affected. If it's here, then the, the spine may get its accelerated growth and the leg may be unaffected. And I've actually, I'm ahead of myself. Here, I've added this here. Here is the male. So that it's the same pattern, but set a bit later. And then if a disease strikes here, it's everything in males and females. Here, the disease strikes. The spine, not the legs, are affected. Here, everything is affected in the male. Here, nothing is affected. So... The point of growth was what, what I really wanted to make, that during this setting up of the morphology, diseases striking will have different effects by, ray, by sex, and I could not show you the data by race, but we, we have that sort of data. 
Let me then turn to advancing age, and this is actually Michelangelo here, who's been lost a lot of bone in this particular image in the Sistine Chapel. All structures develop micro damage, bridges, roads, building, but only bone has a cellular machinery that signals where the damage is, signals the size of the damage, and signals the cells of the marrow and the circulating cells to come and do their stuff, remove the damaged bone and replace it with an equal volume of new bone, maintaining the pristine state of the skeleton as it was developed during growth and development. That process of remodeling is surface dependent. The notion of a surface in bone is my dream to get across to you. And this is something I learned from Michael Parfit. There is an external surface where there's very little going on in the adult. There is the intracortical, the myriads of canals traversing through the cortex upon which remodeling takes place. You have to see it in your mind's eye to understand it. It just doesn't, remodeling doesn't just happen in the mineralized bone, it happens on a surface. And the consequences can only be understood by recognizing that. It also happens on the endocortical surface and on the trabecular surface. And this is the remodeling pathway that you're aware of, resorptions in bone, putting it back, and so forth. And this process breaks down. The single abnormality that is responsible for osteoporosis is the reduction in bone formation at the cellular level. A hole is dug and it is replaced with less bone. This here is the single abnormality. And even during therapy, when we give drugs, if that negative balance is not corrected, Despite compliance with therapy, the decay of bone will continue if that negative balance continues and persists. So if you have someone, say, on an anti-resorptive drug, that person has very high bone remodeling, and you reduce it by 50%, you still have 50% of that remodeling taking place decaying the bone. But the bone density machine can't see it because the small volume of mineral being removed from by that remodeling process is overwhelmed by the secondary mineralization of osteons that are no longer being removed. They are staying there and the crystals enlarge. That's what secondary mineralization is. They enlarge, displace water from the fibril and so the bone becomes more homogeneously dense. The bone density goes up, but the bone density is going up in a tissue volume, a bone volume that's going down. So this is the key abnormality, and here is the decrease in mean wall thickness. This is the morphological measure, a two-dimensional measurement, of the amount of bone that is deposited within each remodeling site. And this actually decreases, but the resorption pit also decreases. But the decrease in formation is greater than the decrease in resorption, so the net effect is a negative balance. And this in women is exacerbated by an increase in remodeling rate. So now after menopause, there are many, many remodeling sites going on on the surface of the skeleton, and each one is removing a tiny, tiny moiety, minus one or minus two percent. But after 50 years of this decay, there is loss of half of the skeleton and therefore osteoporosis. This is work from, Ashim, uh, from, uh, from Ashil Bajornarum, who was with me for, for about two or three years, and, and, and this is one of the papers that we have published, showing an inverse relationship between remodeling and the, the remodeling markers and the surface of trabecular bone. Trabecularly are fashioned, are configured in three-dimensional space as thin plates. When resorption occurs upon them, those plates disappear and they are lost completely. When they are lost, remodeling can no longer take place. So after about 70 years of age, the remodeling that is occurring is not trabecular in origin. Most of the trabecular bone is gone. The notion of, of osteoporosis being a trabecular disease is, I believe, quite incorrect. <laughs>
So here's the changes that take place, progressive decay of the trabeculae, complete loss, and then progressive fragility of the bone. But I want to show you some data here from Mark Forward, and I think he may be at this Congress. I thought I saw him, but this is Mark's lovely work showing the cortices of the vertebral body. Each of these four is a cortex. Look at, they look like trabeculae because they've become so porous. So even the decay of the cortical shell on trabeculae is contributing to the fragility of ver to vertebral fractures. Here is the Haversian canals. You see the canals, you see the lacunae that contain the osteocytes that signal the, the, where bone remodeling needs to take place. And then here now, there is a positive relationship between bone remodeling and the, and the surface. In other words, within the cortex, as the holes enlarge, the area, the surface area, that envelope in the, within the cortex gets bigger. As it gets bigger, more of the remodeling being signaled within the mineralized matrix can find a spot on the surface to initiate remodeling and go back in to remodel the bone. And we believe that's a self-exacerbating -ex process. The more the remodeling, the larger the hole. The larger the hole, the more surface. The more surface, the more remodeling, the more remodeling, the more hole, and so forth, and so on. So there's a progressive decay. And it is occurring. And this is what my, my student, Roger Zabezi, showed me. And it's an important lesson, the lessons we learn from our students. We look for 30 years at data, then some young guy comes in and says, no, you've been looking at it wrongly. And that's why we need to stay very humble. And there's no way that this hole out here can have occurred by resorption from the inside, which is the teachings from Parfit and all of the classical teaching of bone remodeling, that the thinning of the cortex occurs from the marrow inwards. No, it's occurring from within, and there's cavitation and delay and, and decay uh, from within. And you see that here, here are the Haversian canals, and here is the normal cortex, lots of bone now full of holes. You could water ski on these holes and progressive decay. The bone that you see here is not trabecular bone. It's the fragmented bone which is called trabecularization. Trabecularization has been described for 70 years. I mean, Frost described it, Robert Recker described it, everyone, but we've quantified it now. And so this is making an important contribution. And if you look now at menopause here, the amount of bone that is lost at menopause is similar for cortical and trabecular bone. The trabecular bone is being lost more rapidly because it has a higher surface to volume ratio. But the more rapid loss of a smaller volume of bone equals the slower loss of the much larger volume. 80% of the skeleton is cortical in origin. And so most of the, even around menopause, those first 10 years after menopause, there's equal amounts of bonus, not a predominantly trabecular disease. And then after about 60, most of the bone that is lost is cortical in origin. So 80% of all fractures in the community are non-vertebral fractures. The flagship of osteoporosis, vertebral bone loss and vertebral fractures is the wrong flagship. The, both non-vertebral and, and vertebral fractures are important, but these fractures are extremely important and the likelihood that your, the patient in front of you will have a fracture is that it's going to be a non-vertebral fracture rather than a vertebral fracture. And this porosity increase that I showed you has a profound effect on the loss of strength. It is go, it is the, the loss of stiffness of cortical bone goes to the seventh power of the rise in porosity. A huge, a tiny change in porosity produces a marked decrease in strength. This is, talk is not about treatment, but the point I want to make here is that we only have about five or six drugs, residronate, alendronate, denosumab, strontium ranolate, and alendronate, that have to some degree been shown to reduce all of the fractures. And even then, 
Uh, some of this data is post hoc analysis, the human brain interfering with nature, very, very dangerous. So here, for alendronate, for example, there's no evidence in the FIT1 and FIT trial for non-vertebral fracture risk reduction. It was only in the post hoc analysis. For strontium ranolate, there was no evidence for hip fractures other than a post hoc analysis where they identified people under 75 with, with osteoporosis. In these other trials, uh, there were the, the evidence untouched by human the human mind, shows reduction in all three fractures. In terms of raloxifene, the bandronate, teriparatide, PTH, there's evidence primarily for vertebral fractures. I'm not prepared to put anything next to calcitriol, calcitonin, calcium and vitamin D. Poor study design, poor execution of trials, dropouts, forget about it. You have violated the randomization process and then the arguments about whether calcium does this or vitamin D does that comes down to who's more eloquent than somebody else or who's more articulate or who is more intelligent. That's not the game that we play. We play data. With advancing age, here is this increase in porosity, but what's measured currently is that the porosity is measured in the compact appearing cortex. And when we do that, the decrease in cortical VBMD, which is the inverse of porosity, is modest. But we're making a mistake that, in fact, this bone here is not trabecular bone, and the porosity that produced the trabecularization of the, corte of the cortex has to be included in the calculation. So the true decrease in cortical VBMD is being incorrectly assessed. So we're assessing the risk in our patient. We're not identifying our patients at risk. That's important because we have to be able to target who we treat based on their morphology and based on the pathogenesis of the disease. We're one of the rare diseases where we give the same drug at the same dose to everybody. Are you kidding me? You think that's okay? I don't think that's okay. This is trabecular bone here. This is cortical bone. This is trabecular bone. We make the same mistake in the trabecular compartment. We underestimate the decrease in trabecular bone because we're calling fragmented cortical bone trabecular bone. You can see the difference. Have a look at the crenation that is present there, and you can see the osteons within the bone. This is cortical bone. And so when we include it, the decrease in trabecular density, the way we measure it, is underestimated. When we correctly measure it by removing the contribution of trabecular fragments to in the medullary compartment, we get the true decrease. And then we can start saying, you're at great risk, you're not at risk, and so forth. Bone density here in this minus 2.5 cutoff, one of the greatest, uh, well, issues for me, 75% of all fractures occur above minus 2.5. So screening programs cannot work because you will send the people home who, have gone, uh, who are going to have the fractures. Is this predominance of the population burden in the osteopenic range due to simply there being more people in the bell of the Gaussian distribution, or have those people got abnormalities? And they have. This is data that I think was being presented at this meeting at one of the sessions. Here with normal bone density here, these patients here, um, with normal bone density, they have abnormalities in bone volume, in trabecular bone volume that distinguishes them. I showed you our forearm data before with normal bone density but increased porosity. And this is some further data where we have patients with so-called osteoporosis, but they have no porosity. They have they haven't lost bone, they've got small bones. They're not necessarily more fragile, and we're labelling them as, the, as if they've got a disease. And then we have people with osteopenia, so-called, whatever that means, but they have high porosity. What I'm trying to say is we have to turn to morphology to really identify risk and then allocate treatment appropriately. So this is the bone density machine. I think I'm about done. Here you have a structure 
You send photons through, and it gives you a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional structure. You have a small bone where nothing has happened, and you get a low BMD, and you think a lot has happened. You have a different bone where there's lots of bone loss within the envelope here, inside the bone, with thinning of trabeculae, but at the same time, you have periosteal apposition, the net bone density, because it's the sum of what has happened on the outside plus the removal of bone on the inside, giving you no change. So you think there's no change when there's enormous change. I'm not knocking bone density because I want to knock it. I accept that it is a predictor of fracture of one of the things we have for predicting fractures. Why I'm concerned about it is that it's messing up our thinking. And it's people growing up in the field who are using only bone densitometry will not learn how to think. So the right questions, the right answer requires the right question. And what is the effect of growth, nutrition, exercise, aging, race, disease and therapies on material composition and the structure of the bone and in particular the surface envelopes. Thank you for your attention.